My name is Ed Kilbane. I'm a psychiatrist. Um, I specialize in psychosomatic medicine, or what used to be called consult liaison psychiatry. So it's psychiatry for medically and surgically ill patients. Uh, and specifically at Stanford, I specialize in the cancer center patients and have done a fellowship in psycho-oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering. So how to deal with some of the psychiatric issues involved in uh, dealing with the diagnosis and treatment of cancer. Um, there's not a lot of people doing it, and there's a great need for it. And I think uh, as, as we go along, we realize not only do the patients have great psychological needs, but also uh, the caregivers have um, great psychological needs. And I think a caregiver comes in multiple forms, which I'll get to in a second. I really like the talk or the topic of this, uh, the kind of um, title of this uh, talk tonight, because uh, this wasn't the plan is something I see every day. I'm not sure these days if we ever know what the plan is supposed to be, given the complexity of some of the medical issues we deal with and some of the varying treatment plans. Um, palliative care doctors these days are oftentimes using the word roadmap, trying to give patients and their families a roadmap for how treatment is going to progress. And, and the one thing I like about roadmaps is that you can inherently put in detours um, because there are going to be detours. And if you acknowledge up front that there will be detours, but that we will make every effort to get people back on track, I think you're, I think you're being honest and, and simple enough in trying to explain things. Uh, and then the roller coaster part of the title of this talk, I, you know, I think uh, kind of speaks inherently to the fact that there are ups and downs in, in, in patients dealing with an illness and in, in their loved ones taking care of them and dealing as well. Um, caretaking is not always bad. Uh, there, there have to be some upsides to it, otherwise people wouldn't do it. We do it because we love people. We do it sometimes because we feel that there's an obligation that we must fulfill and that, that serves some sort of need for us. There's great honor in taking care of people. Uh, and we're the best ones to take care of our loved ones because we know them the best and we can help them achieve the best quality of life they can uh, for whatever they're going through. Um, but unfortunately, I think a lot of the times caregiving is difficult and, and we tend to focus on some of the negative aspects of it because those are things that we can try to mediate and things that we can try to help with. Um, just to give a couple, kind of quick case examples of the things that I see on a, a daily basis, and I think they might come across as pretty dramatic, and maybe it's a selection bias because I deal with pretty sick patients and so I tend to see things that are quite severe, but this is what I see happening every day, and so I tend to think that the needs of caregivers are pretty great for, for what I see. And caregivers come you know, in the forms of spouses, in the forms of adult children taking care of an even older parent, uh, in the forms of the medical staff, I think, working with patients. I work primarily on the bone marrow transplant unit, and there's patients who are hospitalized for prolonged periods of time. And the nurses, the clerks, the ancillary health staff, the physicians, I think really develop a sense of wanting to help and being part of this patient's journey, and oftentimes uh, experiencing some of the difficulties that, that caregiving entails. Um, but kind of just a couple vignettes to kind of highlight who the caregiver might be. There was a, a young man, a 36-year-old surgeon uh, at Stanford who had metastatic uh, pancreatic cancer a couple of years ago, right when I was hired. And his girlfriend happened to be a physician there as well and was rotating with the psychiatric service at the time. Uh, he, had, he was living with his parents, uh, both his parents. His uh, other sister lived locally in, in this area. She was also taking care of him. He had a younger brother who had come back from college to help take care of him. Uh, because he trained at Stanford and worked there, uh, you could imagine that when he was in the hospital, a lot of the nurses and the doctors felt this draw to really take care of him. It became very apparent that this gentleman had many, many people that could be considered caretakers and all that wanted to have a role in helping him out. And sometimes all that couldn't have a role because there's only so many people that can get involved at certain times. And I think sometimes we have to identify what's our need, what's, what's going to fulfill us versus what's maybe in the best need of, of the patient or our loved one. Um, he ultimately um, you know, died and unfortunately died in, in pretty bad circumstances trying to find clinical treatment trials in New York City. Uh, and in the context of his dying, his brother also committed suicide because he was so distraught over this. And, and I, it taught me a big lesson as far as something I already knew but maybe I forgot is that uh, the psychological distress that can be encountered by caretakers is massive. And we identify a patient as our patient and I wish we had the resources to identify other people, family members, as our patients. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't. Um, I can't necessarily treat a family member if they're not an enrolled patient because it's not legal for me to prescribe medication or to necessarily give them counsel. And so we need to be really focused on what available resources do we have for these people. And in that situation, I focused very much on the parents because it was evident how distraught they were. I didn't focus at all on the siblings. And in retrospect, really wished I had to give them a bit more time to maybe seeing where they were at and in the thoughts that maybe this could have been prevented. Um, so, you know, it's, there are definitely downsides to being a caregiver, and it, and it can be difficult. But then the upsides as well, I, I have a patient that I recently started seeing who lived in Alaska for a long time, 
Uh, he also has pancreatic cancer, which can be quite uh, dangerous. He's going to die soon, and he's okay with it. He's moved back to the area, lives with his adult daughter, who he's always had a good relationship with, but hasn't seen in many years. And to see the two of them in my office connecting in a way that they haven't connected in years is, is quite powerful. And her accepting that this is what's going to happen to him, and actually giving him permission to stop a clinical trial, uh, which he needed. Otherwise, he would have kept doing it because he felt that he was doing something for them. And him and, his, and the other daughter gave him permission to stop. Uh, and, and they're really at peace with it and enjoying the time they have left together. And it's quite powerful to see this bond develop and her ability to kind of repay him for all that he did for her. Uh, it's, it's quite a strong and powerful thing. Oh, sorry. So, uh, you know, I, I also, I think, probably like everyone here in, in, in the audience, have my own experiences with this. And, and just very brief, but when I was younger, had the opportunity, I think, to take care of um, a dying aunt and a dying grandfather, both within a one-year period, and both on hospice care in my parents' house. Uh, and luckily, I was uh, in between uh, school, and so had the opportunity to be available to them, and, and really kind of look back on it with such fond memories, um, because was able to be a part of their life at such a, 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 in some ways, a difficult time, but in some ways, a poignant time. Um, there's something very dignified about being allowed into someone's life at the point at which they might die. And it's an honor to be allowed into that time period and to be able to learn some of the wisdom in how they deal with these struggles and how they've dealt with struggles throughout their life um, and, and to kind of grow from that. You know, the, the patient is not the only one that goes on a journey. The caretaker goes on a journey as well. And that journey can sometimes be very similar to the patient's journey and it can sometimes be very, very different. And we focus very much on getting the patient back to health or back to optimum functioning or having a good quality of life, I think we need to focus as much on making sure that the caregiver, whoever that might be, also has the best quality of life. And many people take time away from work. Many people take time away from their own hobbies, their, their own social circles. Um, and, and many people you know, develop a sense that they've lost themselves. Oftentimes, patients lose a sense of who they are as a person. They become identified as a patient. Everything they do is going to the hospital, going to clinics, taking medications. And all too often, I see the caretakers lose their sense of self. They become the secretary who's writing down all the notes at an appointment, the appointment keeper, uh, and amongst other things, the banker, the finance person, all these other roles that they might have to take on because the person that once did them is, is not available to do them at that time. So I think it's important to kind of shift people back to kind of who they are uh, as a person and, and to really support some of those things that make them unique and make them you know, kind of their own person. It's, you know, over the past 10, 20 years, we've also seen a huge shift in a very uh, negative word, I suppose, a death trajectory. So it used to be that if you got sick, you died. Uh, there weren't great treatments. Um, we didn't have many chronic illnesses that really kind of let people linger. Uh, and these days, especially in cancer, but also in, in lung disease and heart disease, we have lots of therapies that allow people to continue living, although kind of at what price or what quality of life I think is important to, to recognize. And, and with that goes the recognition that if you're a caregiver, you're going to be caregiving for much longer than you might have anticipated or that we might have ever anticipated in the past. And so trying to figure out how do we kind of enable someone to do that, allow someone to do that, not just on an emotional level, but also on a very practical and financial level. How do you take time away from your life to take care of someone whose life might be prolonged much longer than it would have been 10 or 20 years ago? Uh, according to one of the bone marrow transplant attendings I work with, he says it very bluntly, a quarter of patients live, a quarter of patients die, and half of them are the walking wounded. And that's a very, I think, nice euphemism. Uh, oftentimes the chronic conditions they can get really change and alter uh, who they are as a person, how they view themselves, how they view their relationships, and how, how they can actually live their life. There was a talk at the uh, Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine conference last year in which a psychiatrist from the Mayo Clinic uh, talked about the Coda Vita which I don't know anything about classical music, but supposedly is after a piece is played, a very short piece that kind of resembles the original piece, but is not similar, or is not exactly the same to it. And he was using that as a, a metaphor for uh, what people go through after solid organ transplant and, and live these lives that are, are lives, and they're still alive, but they're a different person. And it's a recognition that we have to have up front that life will be different for these people in many ways, and to prepare people and, and caregivers for how life might be different. So it's not such a shock when it occurs. Uh, Susan Sontag, a famous kind of writer, uh, had a nice quote that illness is the night side of life, a more onerous citizenship. Everyone who is born holds dual citizenship in the kingdom of the well and in the kingdom of the sick. Although we all prefer to use only the good passport, sooner or later each of us is obliged, at least for a spell, to identify ourselves as citizens of that other place. And I like that notion that we can travel back and forth between sickness and health. And for anyone who's been sick, I think they know all too well what it's like to live, to exist in that space for some period of time. 
Um, you know, why is it important to identify some of the psychiatric symptoms that go along uh, you know, with being a patient or with being a caregiver? Quite simply, because we can deal with them. We can actually uh, alleviate some suffering, improve some quality of life, and it's not too difficult. The, the most common psychiatric disease encountered by patients in the hospital is delirium. So it's a confusional state that occurs because of medical issues. It's temporary, but it's damn scary for family members to see their loved one disoriented, scared, hallucinating, making phone calls in the middle of the night, um, acting in ways that they don't normally act. And we're not great at picking it up. We're getting better at screening for it and recognizing it. But we can treat it very effectively and very quickly. And we know that it reduces people's morbidity and mortality and certainly reduces the anxiety and the fear that uh, families experience when they see their loved ones in that state. Um, besides delirium, anxiety and depression are very common in medically ill patients, not necessarily because they have major depressive disorder or generalized anxiety disorder, but because living with the ongoing issues and threats to their physical health that they have uh, demoralizes someone over time. I think by proxy, if you look at caregivers who have to constantly look at their loved one going through this, you can imagine they too would become anxious, depressed, demoralized, hopeless and helpless at times, not quite sure what to do or how to get someone out of the situation. Uh, for patients in the intensive care unit who experience confusion, there's like a 20% rate of post-traumatic stress disorder, um, which we've kind of known about for a while, but we're starting to recognize that family members also experience post-traumatic stress disorder when they see their loved one going through uh, resuscitation or very invasive procedures that don't end well. Um, it, it, it is perceived as a threat not only to their loved one's life, but also a threat to their own life to see um, you know, how fragile the human body actually can be and, and, and how brutal medicine can be at times. But again, I think you know, it's so important to, to recognize some of these psychiatric um, symptoms and, and diagnoses, what call it, whatever you want to call them, in, in patients and caregivers because with psychotherapy, supportive psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral psychotherapy, medications, even brief just to help lower the tone of anxiety, you really can get people functioning better and I think uh, having a better quality of life and also enjoying each other's quality of life much better, especially if someone's coming towards the end of their life. I think it's of um, utmost importance to kind of maintain people's psychological well-being so that they can actually maintain their communication and their relationship style and enjoy each other. Um, you know, when we talk about caregiver exhaustion or burnout, uh, it's a phrase that gets used quite commonly, but you know, it's, uh, I think, defined usually the same way if you look anywhere. And it's kind of you know, emotional, cognitive, and physical exhaustion that happens from kind of constantly having to take care of someone else. And manifests really like depression manifests, sleep changes, appetite changes, concentration changes, uh, you know, weight changes up and down, uh, irritability, mood issues, crying. And crying's good, and crying's human. Um, but crying and not being able to reconstitute oneself and not being able to function is not so good. So I think, again, recognizing these things and being able to get some help for them is, is certainly important. Two of the biggest things that I get concerned about are when people feel helpless and hopeless. Um, helplessness and hopelessness are predictors of suicide. Uh, it does not feel good to be trapped. No one likes to be put into a corner and not have a way out. And it does not feel good to see a light at the end of the tunnel, no matter what that light might be, some sort of end point, some sort of change. And so I think if you recognize that in the person that you're caring for, if you recognize it in yourself, if other people tend to recognize it in you, that's really uh, an impetus to get some professional help or to talk to someone about it, because um, it really can be a dangerous situation. Besides some of the kind of psychiatric symptoms that arise in caretaking, I think some of the psychodynamic issues are fascinating and, and more interesting for me to, to kind of look into because it's more than just prescribing a medication. But if one of the biggest things I see commonly is role reversal. Uh, it's amazing how often you start to learn what each part of the couple did based on what the caretaker has to do now, has to learn this whole new set of skills. Um, there, there's kind of this shift from spouse to what I call policeman or policewoman. Uh, one person is telling the other one, you have to take these medications, you have to go to the doctor, you have to go to the hospital. And, uh, and a lot of tension mounts from that and, and a lot of animosity on the part of the patient. Uh, they don't like to be told what to do. Uh, again, you know, you're their spouse, you're not their parent, you're not the policeman, you're not their physician. Um, but that's born out of a good intention. People want the best for their, for their loved one. Uh, but sometimes it can come across as being, uh, you know, I think a bit too aggressive. Um, oftentimes when people are sick, they, they regress to earlier forms of functioning and act almost childlike. You know, being ill, so disease is the kind of pathological you know, state, but being ill is how someone experiences disease, and that can vary depending on someone's cultural, religious beliefs, um, you know, social context. Um, but 
the, the kind of sick role or sick behavior is something that we all tend to like in some ways. You get taken care of. Uh, people pay attention to you. People meet your needs. People coddle you. That's great for a certain period of time, but it can become pretty evident that that becomes embedded in someone and they start to act out more infantile behavior than might be beneficial to them. Um, and sometimes it feels good for the caretaker too because here you don't feel so helpless. You can actually provide some sort of soothing, uh, but ultimately it usually doesn't work out so great for the couple. It's also interesting to, to really note that a threat to physical integrity uh, almost always is accompanied by a threat to psychic integrity. So if someone becomes physically ill, uh, kind of associated with that is if I can become physically ill, if this part of me can become damaged, am I whole, am I integral, am I, am I a person? Um, and it really challenges someone's sense of mortality and kind of who they are as a person. I think it's important to recognize that when people are having procedures done to them or, or, or being hospitalized multiple times, that this actually is a threat to their ego, to their sense of who they are as, as a person, uh, and can be quite damaging over time. You know, if the treatments we give these days affect people's idea of, kind of who they are sexually, what, what their um, gender role is, what their physical appearance is. Uh, and it's important to kind of recognize that that also then can have a, a play on, on relationships. You know, does a spouse find their, their husband or wife sexually attractive anymore? Are they starting to, to miss the intimacy that they once had? And if you can recognize those things, you can start to address them if the, if the couple wants to, because there's many ways to be intimate uh, besides uh, you know, sexual, sexual intercourse. There's many ways to be a parent um, when, when, when a mother or father thinks they can't be a parent anymore. Uh, many ways to show love to your, to your children. Uh, and then the use of psychological defenses. It's very interesting to see what people employ. Humor tends to be a great one. Uh, and it's, it's, it's amazing to see people use humor in the, in the, in the context of such dire times. Denial tends to be huge. And you know, sometimes th there's no point in challenging denial because if denial is what is keeping someone intact and not falling apart, then it's fine to let someone stay in denial. Um, sublimation or kind of the, the using one's difficult situation to make something better I think is always a profound human trait and one that just uh, makes me realize how noble people are sometimes. And we see this in cancer where patients know they're dying, but they want to go on a clinical trial, not because they think it's going to do anything for them, but because they actually think it might do something for somebody else. That's an amazing shift to see in, in, in a human being. Um, just to end, some of the tools that I think can help a lot, and I think the other speakers will probably go over these maybe in, in more depth. I think open communication is always key. Um, you know, between sp spouses, I often hear uh, the, the sick person saying, I don't want to burden them. I don't want to make them more anxious. And then you ask the, the partner, why aren't you talking to them? Well, they're sick. I don't want to burden them. I don't want to make them more anxious. You're both thinking the exact same thing. Uh, and if, if you've had a good communication style throughout your life, why not continue to utilize that and, and kind of work through this together and problem solve together? I think rely on what you know your loved one can handle. You know their communication style better than anyone else. You know their tolerance. So if you need to titrate information to a certain level, uh, let the medical team know that. You know, we can't handle this much information. This will overwhelm the person. I think take time for yourself. Um, I see a lot of people on the bone marrow transplant unit there all day long. And I think I can't stay there all day long. It drives me crazy. Uh, and so I think people need to have permission to be allowed to take a walk, to have lunch, to, to just take some time for themselves. I think recognizing the positive aspects of caregiving is important, that this is it's not all for naught, that there's something uh, quite amazing that can be gained in this. Um, you know, I think trying not to feel guilty is probably one of the things that I try to focus on the most. You know, I, people often think it, but they don't say it. I wish this person would just die. Um, most people think that at some point, and they don't think it out of a selfish reason, because they want a break. They think it because they watch their loved one go through so much difficulty and so much struggling and they think I just want this person to be at peace and so if you thought at some point I just I wish this would end that's not something to feel guilty about that's actually something to in some ways I think be admirable that you, you really your best intention is that this person be at peace um, when it comes to planning on kind of what might happen at the end of life you know these and this is doctors are probably at the, the biggest fault for this having these discussions much earlier on you know, what, what do you want done in the event that you can't make decisions for yourself? Would you want to be intubated or resuscitated? Um, luckily, we have a form now called the POLST, which is Physician's Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. Not great, but much better than what we used to have, and really starts to clearly spell out kind of what you would and would not want to happen in different situations, as opposed to just, do you want a tube down your throat, or do you want to be resuscitated? We should not leave these decisions to family members to make when someone is imminently going to die, and that's usually the way it happens. Uh, people are anxious, people are grieving, um, and some people don't have the education or kind of medical savvy to even know 
what this entails or what it means. So I think it's, it's a huge fault of ours to leave that decision to uh, caregivers in a time where they're trying to grieve and trying to deal with a difficult situation. So if you can have that discussion much more upfront with your loved one, it puts you in a much better place down the road, I think, to, to honor their wishes. Um, and then I think just to end on bereavement and to recognize that after someone dies, we tend to not be able to follow families or caregivers that well. I don't anyway. And I know there's a lot of resources out there for bereavement and, and for what happens afterwards. And I think it's important to recognize that you probably will have, uh, you know, grief is human. To cry, to be upset is human. To miss someone is human. But if that persists, if it leads to anxiety, depression, social isolation, there's a lot of resources out there to help. And, and I think it behooves people to really take those up. So thank you. Okay, I think I'm next. And I'm short, so I'm going to stand up so I can see everybody. Um, my name's Amy, and I'm a social worker at Cancer Care Point. We are a nonprofit organization down in San Jose, really close to Good Samaritan Hospital. We are not affiliated with any hospital. We serve everybody in the community. And we provide non-medical social emotional support for cancer patients and their families. So all of the services and programs that we have available to patients are also available to caregivers as well because as we know, it's not just the patient that's going through an illness, but it's the whole entire family unit. So I'm curious just to see, is everybody in the room a caregiver? You could, everybody is, yeah? Okay. Um, and how many of you are, are caring for somebody with a cancer diagnosis? A lot of you. And probably other chronic illnesses if it's not cancer. Um, and how many of you are caring for a loved one on a long-term or ongoing basis? You know this is something that's going to be okay. So I was wanting to get some numbers just about caregivers. And, and you all are living it, but here's what caregivers look like in the United States. There's actually an estimated 44.4 million caregivers in the United States, which is amazing. That's so many. 21% uh, of the adult population are caregivers. It's almost a quarter of the adult population. The average age of a caregiver in the U.S. is 46 years old. More than half, 58% of all caregivers are between the ages of 18 and 49. And 15% of all caregivers live more than one hour away from their loved one. So is there anyone here tonight that drives um, a distance, like an hour or so, to see? Or is everybody caring for somebody either in their home or local? Okay. And 59% of caregivers are working either part-time or full-time while caring for their loved one. So do we have some folks that are working while caregiving, which again is, is amazing. Um, so the most frequently reported unmet needs of caregivers, is finding time for yourself, you all know that, I'm sure, managing emotional stress, and then balancing work and family responsibilities. So it's just amazing, uh, you know, what you all are doing. It's, it's, it strikes me every, every time that I meet with a caregiver and, and everything that's on your plate. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is how do you cope with all of that? And I'm going to try to give you all some um, brief ways to cope. So I'm going to talk about educating yourself creating a team to help you care give, support and what options for support are out there, and then also taking care of yourself. We got to get that from the bottom of the list up a little bit, which I know is hard to do. So educating yourself, what does that mean? What does that look like? Learning as much as you can about your loved one's illness, how it's treated, and what resources are available specifically to that illness so that you can reduce the uncertainty and stress. If you know what you're dealing with, oftentimes that's just, it makes it a little bit more um, doable to, to care, to, to deal with. 
Obtain help with medical tasks. Many caregivers report feeling unprepared to provide the medical care their loved one needs at home. If there is any responsibility you're not sure about, you want to discuss it with members of your loved one's health care team, talk to their doctors. Make sure that you understand what the doctors are instructing you to do. Write them down so you don't forget. Find out who you can call if, you, if any questions come up. If you're the one responsible, you want to know there's somebody that you can call kind of as a backup that can reinforce, oh, I think they said this, and you know somebody's there that you can call to double check with. Get one-on-one -on -one support. Online research and information is through the roof. There's so much of it, and that can be daunting even to begin looking online for information. Consider speaking directly with a nurse or doctor or pharmacist about your concerns. One-on-one -on -one conversations, you know you're speaking specifically to your loved one's issues. You're not speaking general. You're not reading about something that has nothing to do with your loved one's illness like you might do online. And it provides reassurance and gives you information tailored to your needs. You can also look into national and local organizations specific to your loved one's illness. That also can be a fabulous resource um, for many types of different things. So creating a team, what does that mean? Think about all those people that love your family member or spouse. Think about other family members, friends, members of a local church that you belong to, other organizations that you belong to. These are people that want to help. Is there a swarm of bees or what? <laughs> That's OK. We'll keep going. <laughs> Oh, is it? <laughs> no problem. Um, <laughs> so you really want to think about those people that are around you and your loved one that really want to help. And they need specific things to do. And often, you know, when I'm talking with cancer patients, They'll talk about, well, you know, people call and they want to do something and I don't know what to tell them and they keep bringing food and our freezer is full and, you know, all of those things. People want specific tasks. That is like the best gift that you can give to them. If you give them specific tasks that would really take something off your plate and, and then allow them to help. People really want to help. So it could be shopping, errands, meal preparation, cleaning. There's a wonderful organization called Cleaning for a Reason. It's for cancer patients, and they will actually come into your house while your loved one is going through cancer treatment and clean your house once a month, which is amazing. So people want to help, help them. Tell them how they can help you. And be proactive. Take charge and plan as much as possible to prevent those last-minute emergencies. Like Ed was saying, you want to have these discussions and talk about things far before you get to the point uh, where it's an emergency. There's also some websites that can be really helpful. And I left a list of some resources on the table over there. One is carepages.com, there's caringbridge.com, and lotsahelpinghands.com. These are amazing websites. You create your own little website just for you and your loved one, or even better yet, have a friend set it up for you. And you send out emails and invite people to join your group. You can identify tasks that need to be done. There's calendars. You can sign up, OK, we need food these days. Um, my husband needs a ride this day, whatever, whatever it may be. And then those that are invited and participating in the group can go on, click, and sign up for something that they are able to do. So that's just a way of communicating without making a million phone calls. Um, it's also a great way to give updates on your loved one's health. 
via email. So again, all those phone calls, you're not having to have the same conversation over and over. You just send one email out and it gets everybody up to date, which I think is appreciated by those um, around you. And know yourself and recognize your own strengths and your own limitations. This allows you to kind of set boundaries for yourself. If there's certain things you know you're not good at, find somebody that is or somebody that enjoys doing that and know when to ask for help. So the third thing I'm going to talk about is support and what kind of support out is out there. One of the things that we do at Cancer Care Point is we do a number of support groups. And a lot of people think they're not support group people. And I always encourage them, we'll try it a couple times. Because what I've found through my experience, and I facilitate most of the groups that we do at Cancer Care Point, what I've found is people really like being in a room with other people that are going through or have been through a similar experience. Cancer patients, even when they think they're not a group person, then they come and they want to know when, you know, if they can come to multiple ones. And, you know, it's, it's amazing. But it's that connection that they have with other people that get it. You all are sitting in a room, and you know you can look around. Everybody here gets it, and that's really important. Just like cancer patients or survivors need their place to go to just kind of unload a little bit and also support people and encourage people and then have that reciprocated, caregivers need the same thing. I just did a caregivers group last week, and it was amazing. Right off the bat, one of the women, we were kind of checking in and going around and uh, introducing everybody. And right off the bat, one of the women said, oh, gosh, I feel, I feel really bad even saying this. And I said, well, go ahead. You know, it's all right. And she said, I'm just so tired of this. I'm, I'm tired of it. Well, like yours, all the other heads in the room were nodding. And I was like, did you see? <laughs> Everybody else gets it. They understand. So don't feel bad. This is the place to have those really honest conversations. And there's something very comforting and freeing about that when you really can be honest and you know there's not going to be any judgment um, or anything like that. So I'm sure you all are aware, and if you're not, I could certainly help you find a support group close to home and one that you that would fit your needs. Um, but I'd encourage all of you to, to at least give it a try. And you know, all the feelings that come up, anger, guilt, isolation, fear, sadness, the anticipatory grief, all of those things are discussed and really normalized. And I always encourage the folks to, to just be patient and kind, just like you would you know, with the people sitting next to you. And be patient and kind with yourself. That's really important. Insurance assistance. Sometimes you can, for some insurance providers, they will actually assign you an insurance case manager, which can be fantastic. So there's your insurance expert. Um, and they can help to manage insurance concerns for a person with a serious illness. The representative can be a resource for determining which benefits are covered, deciding whether arrangements can be made to access out of plan benefits for medically necessary care, finding available home care, or troubleshooting insurance problems. So know that that's an option. Ask. Ask if your insurance company does that, if they offer a representative or a case manager. Also, if you are working, which some of you are, I hope you know about the Family and Medical Leave Act. And this act requires employers with 50 or more employees to provide up to 12 weeks of unpaid job protected leave for employees who need time off to care for an ill loved one. So your benefits are still there, your job is held, and um, you know all of that is uh, continues during during the 12 weeks off but that's something that you could talk to your employer about it's something that hopefully they're all providing but can be a really nice time um, especially if it's a cancer patient or somebody that's going through there might be a more intense period during treatment things like that um, to be able to not be juggling that 
that work and, and caregiving duties. Also, the legal documents, Ed um, also brought up, advanced directives. Anybody 18 and over, we should all have them, whether we're ill or not. And we should have these conversations uh, far before somebody gets ill. But ad advanced directives are an effective, legally binding way to communicate a patient's wishes. And um, there's other, you know, power of attorney for healthcare and, and a living will. Those also, you know, may be, may be appropriate. Uh, local hospitals often have social workers who can be a great resource at that hospital. Oh, <laughs> somebody's shaking their head no. <laughs> Some are good. Um, and it's worth a conversation. And they hopefully, they should know the ins and outs of that hospital, all the resources that are there available to patients and their families, and then also community resources as well. And um, let's see. And the last thing, let's talk about taking care of you. The biggest challenge in all of this. And how do you, I mean, it's almost silly to talk about in a sense, because how do you have the time? But what I encourage you to do is really schedule the time, just like you schedule the doctor's appointments and other things. Feeling stressed and overwhelmed is not a sign that you're somehow failing as a caregiver. But since stress can affect your health, it's important to find ways to manage it. So here we'll talk about some ways to cope um, with stress. Certainly you've all experienced periods of stress and anxiety, possibly dis depression, frustration, and so many other emotions. I think, like Ed said, with certain signs of depression, um, isolation, um, loss of appetite, sleep difficulty, things like that, when you're recognizing that in yourself or somebody else is recognizing it in you, it's really imperative that you talk to a medical professional and get some help with that. You, all, you, you may feel like you're exhausted all the time, getting sick more often, not sleeping, feeling impatient, irritable, forgetful, not enjoying the activities that you used to, withdrawing from others. Um, and, and obviously those are times when you'd wanna reach out and talk to somebody about that. So we want you to take a little bit of time for yourself. And that's gonna look different for everybody. In the caregiver group last week, I asked right before we were wrapping up, I asked if everybody could go around and think of one thing in the last week that they did for themselves. And everybody had a different answer. Some had a more difficult time coming up with something that they actually did for themselves in the last week. But one that I really appreciated, a, a young woman who's been caring for her husband for some time and will continue um, for the rest of his life to care for him. She works full time. She, her answer was a long shower. That's all she could fit in. And I was like, great, enjoy that long shower. If you have that moment, she said, and I asked, what, what do you get from that long shower? What does that do for you? And it's just kind of that quiet, it's relaxing, crank up that hot water, you know, and just really have a moment. So she's been extending her showers a little bit because that's the time that she can find. And that's okay. Now, would I want that only to be her time, you know, for indefinitely? No. Um, but if that's the best she can do right now, that's okay. Um, spending time doing something that you enjoy, giving yourself permission, which is tricky, giving yourself permission to go and enjoy yourself, doing something that you truly enjoy can give you a, a much, much needed break so that you can continue to be an effective caregiver. It also can help the person that you're caring for. There could be guilt on their part for watching you care for them day after day. Um, they'll want you to be healthier and have more energy. They may feel less guilty about accepting your help. 
Um, and hopefully there's other people on that team that we talked about that can kind of fill in for you to allow you to have that time away from, from caregiving. And give some thought to what are some things that fill you up? What feeds your soul? Could be a bike ride. It could be going to the movies, having dinner with a great friend. You know, give some thought to those people that when you leave, you know those great friends that when you leave after spending time for them, you just feel better. Um, spend time with those people. You know, they'll lift you up. They'll give you that energy to carry on. Um, walks, other exercise is fantastic. Um, listening to music, aromatherapy, um, and like I mentioned, those long showers can be great. Um, so here, you know, I know I've just touched very briefly on a few things, and hopefully you'll be able to um, think of some more things that would be helpful to you, and just take this as a starting point and kind of run with it, and later we'll be able to share other things that are helpful to all of you, and hopefully answer some more questions. Um, and, you know, remember to, to get informed and have that education. Know what you're dealing with. Build your team. Be open to support. Give those support groups a try. And, and take care of yourselves. Um, there's also, as I mentioned, I listed some general resources for caregivers on the same sheet with those websites. And um, on a personal note, I just appreciate all that you all do on a daily basis. And, uh, almost 10 years ago, I was on the other side. I was being cared for. I was diagnosed with advanced colon cancer um, almost 10 years ago. And I had a little guy. He was 17 months old. I, had, I, I couldn't. I wanted to take care of him. I couldn't. I was too ill. So I had to count on you know, my husband, who was working full time, my parents, who were local. Um, my mom ended up taking advantage of that family leave and took time off from her job to care for me and my son. But I couldn't have done it without that group of people around me. So I just really um, appreciate all that you are doing and you're all just a wonderful gift. And I hope this, what we can do today is just give you a little bit of um, comfort in knowing that you're not alone and maybe some support as well. <laughs> what? Oh, hi. <laughs> I used to work at Westmont High School. Okay, well, we'll chat later. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Paula Wolfson. I'm the manager of what's called Avenida's Care Partners at Avenida's, which is a senior center. And I run six care caregiver support groups during the month, two here at Stanford, um, two at well, four at the center, two for spouses and two for adult children. And anyone can come to our groups and walk in the door. And it doesn't have to be necessarily about dementia or cognitive decline. It can be about many, many things that we know demands caregiving. Um, someone on our staff once said that there's two kinds of people in the world, those who will be caregiving and those who are caregiving. And it happens. Um, it does happen. And for people to expect for it not to happen in today's world with the increase in the uh, rate of our senior population, I, I think there is a bit of denial there. And I don't believe society is ready for the demands we are going to be facing on um, caring for one another as we age, coupled with illness. Um, my job, people walk in the door every day and I'm talking to either solo agers, um, older folks without children, I'm talking to couples, somebody in the system, in the family system is ill, usually it is in my situation cognitive decline, and they are in shock and don't know what to do because it's going to change the whole dynamic, it's going to affect where they're living, what they can afford, the future, their plans, family vacations, and so much um, is just bubbling up. So I, I begin by telling folks to kind of 
we're going to partialize the problems, we're going to go bit by bit, and we're going to look at, see what we can do in the moment to help resolve some of the um, immediate crisis to then plan for the long term. Caregiving, um, I think, has nothing to do with being on a roller coaster. A uh, roller coaster is something we choose to be on. We strap ourselves in. We kind of can lean on each other. And we can scream. And screaming is OK on a roller coaster. Um, caregiving is, is extremely difficult. And there's sometimes no end in sight. And you don't really know if you're in the beginning, middle phase of it because it changes. There's always a, a new normal. Um, my favorite reference to anybody who's a new caregiver is Gail Shee's book. Passages in Caregiving, Turning Chaos into Confidence. I have the feeling that most of you are kind of experienced caregivers. Does anybody here think of themselves as a new caregiver? OK. OK. So I recommend this book. Um, it's wonderful. She went on a 17-year journey with her husband, who was diagnosed with, uh, I believe, throat cancer. And this is a famous family. She was already famous for her book, Passages. And then her husband, who's a journalist, developed throat cancer and became kind of ill in front of the New York literary world. I mean, it was, uh, it was she had to change her whole life to take care of him, and, and she did it. And she writes very, um, her tale is very personal, and it's, it's a good read for anyone caregiving with any kind of situation. Um, she begins by talking about being in shock and then having to mobilize, and then really looking at how caregiving affects what your core values are and how it, it um, grows your civility, your humanity. Um, if you rise to the job, uh, it's going to demand that you are constantly self-examining your priorities and your values because it takes your time and it becomes the main focus of your life. So to work in time for yourself, to um, go to the caregiver support groups, to do all of these other things for you to remember who you are and that you are a person with a, a full life is a constant um, challenge. And that's where I recommend it is good to be in a support group, to find somebody to talk to, to find peers. In the senior world, we're now um, looking at the village concept where for people to age in place, stay at home, and there's networks being created by email. People are bartering services and goods. And I think that caregivers should start to do the same, that somehow there should be a link among people who are caregivers to um, meet one another in your neighborhood, your community. At, Avenida, at Avenidas, we're going to do a um, caregiver conference September 28th. And I've decided to do a um, session where we divide up into small groups because I want people to meet each other and find out who they are and where they live and, and possibly create some sort of um, exchange. It becomes hard going to these conferences and just sitting and being passive in audience and listening to us. Like, you're the experts, really. So that conference is September 28th. It's, it's only $35. And there's um, a lot of folks coming and donating their time. The conference is all donated by the, the part of the, the speakers. What I put together in this package tonight is just information that I think is useful for any, anybody in the caregiving role. There's an article on patience. Um, I think that is the main caregiver tool is being patient and um, cultivating it as a practice. Because when you are constantly negotiating, mediating, clarifying, representing somebody who's sick, you're, gonna, you're, you're constantly um, bumping into things. For instance, in the hospital, the hospital discharge world, um, it's hard. I was a hospital social worker for many years in different places in the country. And I think that's one of the biggest drains on caregivers is the, the whole process of being in the hospital, the emergency room, finding out who your team is, the team changes, the story changes. And then you know, you're in the ICU one minute, then you're out, you're on a medical service, and all of a sudden, they're ready to go. And the question is, where are they going? What's the care going to be? How is your insurance going to pay? And all of this somehow feels like it's being discussed as you're being ushered out the door. Um, and so that is a 
a huge caregiver dilemma. That was me, not you. And um, so I've put some information in these packets about um, hospital discharge planning, a checklist. I am big on checklists. I think when you're so overwhelmed that you need to constantly just have a checklist. So in this package, there's a family checklist, there's a hospital discharge checklist, um, what questions to ask when you're in the hospital. I did bring with me a copy of advanced directives. This is the pulsed form, and they're here if anybody wants to look at them. And then if you're at a point where you just have to start dealing with hiring professional help, whether it's um, in your home for skilled home care or placement, or if you're thinking about relocating to a board and care, assisted living, don't do that alone. And go on the um, Family Caregiver Alliance and read all of their checklists and the questions to ask. Because there are things that people don't know about. For instance, if you have somebody in an independent or assisted care facility and they have an advanced directive and they have a pulse, but something happens to them and they code, they, the, by law, that facility has to call the paramedics. They have to take them to the hospital, and then these can go into effect in the emergency room. Right. That's why I'm bringing, bringing it up, because I think a lot of people don't realize that um, when we talk about advanced directives or pulse or being the durable power of attorney, it's not, it's, it's not a package with a bow on it. There's lots of complicated factors. Having the durable power of attorney for health and financing only takes effect once a person's confused. So you can have it, but if they disagree with what you're thinking that, you know, should happen and they're voicing their opinion and they're, they've been admitted to the hospital um, voluntarily, they can leave. Um, they can leave the nursing home. They can leave uh, wherever it is they happen to be voluntarily. So um, just having the durable power of attorney doesn't always give one the, the control that you think you have. And these are the kinds of things I talk about and counsel people about in, in my office. I've, my cards are here. They're, there's information in the package. Avenidas has lots of nice programs, social programs for um, seniors to come to. I can tell you the good news. There's uh, an 83-year-old woman still doing yoga. There's a 100-year-old woman teaching uh, social dancing to young couples getting married. Um, there's amazing people out there in their 80s and their 90s. So we are living longer and, in some cases, healthier. So. Hello. My name is Deborah Mills, and I do graphic design for a living, and that's how I know Pam. Um, in February of 2009, my mother fell and broke her leg and went to a rehab for a few months and came to stay with me at my house in Mountain View. Um, I took my father to stand for a number of times for different things, and he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, um, which changed our lives because he could no longer go home. I do work from home, so it works out okay. I can pretty well handle whatever goes on. I can hear what's going on in the house, um, so that makes it a workable situation. I do take him to Mountain View Senior Center for lunch every day, work my schedule around 11 and 1 o'clock, so they get it out every day, which works really well for them. Um, my mother has limited function, um, really bad arthritis, so she can't bathe herself or such. Um, and my father is progressing more fast now. We have a lot more imaginary people in the house. Um, but. It works because we have a pretty good attitude. And um, my life changed a lot. I have not really had a vacation in four years. Um, but I have good friends, and I do have a good support system from that perspective. My brother comes up to visit every few months for a weekend, and I get away for a night. Um, and I have visited the Alzheimer's support group a few times. I haven't been really good about this, but I think it's something I need to look into. Um, our, my sanity is basically based on them being positive. My mother has a pretty good attitude about it. Um, my father has become childlike. He's probably someone I didn't really like that much, and now I've learned to love because he's a child. And um, he's funny. He, humor is 
he will say things like, we just came back from a 10-day trip to, on the plane to Michigan, which was a real challenge. Um, and, we, and he was sick there and he had to go to the emergency and you know, all this stuff happened. And we get on the plane coming home, he turns to me and goes, are you an orphan? I mean, you know, and you have to laugh. You just have to laugh because this is so crazy. And, and I'll hear him talking to my mother in the house, and he'll say things like, well, the landlady says I can't do that anymore. Or where's that lady that gives me meds? Or he'll come to my office and go, where's Deborah? I haven't seen her in days. You know, and um, it's a functional situation. I don't have any idea what the future is, um, but it's working for now. And I'm very thankful that I have a chance to do this. It's not easy, but I've been really lucky. Most of my friends don't have two parents. I've been very lucky to have my parents. And I don't really have a plan. I'm taking it a day at a time. And, and I guess the other way I handle it is I know that this is a chapter in my life, and there'll be another chapter afterwards. And I feel like I'm doing the right thing, and here I am. So.